Good afternoon and welcome to Preparing Your Health System for Infectious Disease Outbreaks, a complimentary webinar from healthsystemcio.com. Just some housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of healthsystemcio.com and I'll be your moderator today. We encourage you to ask questions, a uh, good topic for it. Go ahead and type them in at any time in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. In the Q&A box, I'll leave the default set to all panelists. We'll be looking at those and posing them to our panelists later in the program. Um, you can download the deck at any time. You see the URL in front of you. There's a shortened URL on all slides, and it's also in your chat box. And we are recording today's event, and the archive should be ready within two business days. Uh, you'll receive an email when it's ready, and a separate registration is required. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to hear, this may not be exactly true to form, but we're going to hear from Daniel Barchi, SVP and CIO at Yale New Haven Health System, along with Lisa Stump, Associate CIO at Yale New Haven Health System, and then we'll be doing our Q&A. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel and Lisa. Daniel? Great. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, Lisa Stump is the Associate CIO for the Yale New Haven Health System, and I'm the CIO for the Yale New Haven Health System, and we're sitting together in an office in New Haven, Connecticut. Happy to chat this afternoon about our experience um, with preparing for infectious disease outbreaks uh, based on a, some experience that we had last month. We don't claim to have more experience than some other health systems around the nation, like Emory and Texas Health and Bellevue and uh, Omaha, Nebraska all of whom have had uh, live patients with Ebola in there, but an incident last month uh, caused us to evaluate our processes and procedures and what we're doing, and um, we learned from it, and uh, it would probably be good to share today. So uh, last month, on October 15th, um, late in the afternoon, we, uh, we got word that we were to expect a patient who had been to West Africa and was going to be transferred into our ED we were somewhat pre prepared on a couple hours' notice to take the patient, but the um, next couple of hours were a good experience for our health system. We'd done some training before that. We'd prepared with our PPE. We'd reviewed some of our procedures. We were ready in the ED. Uh, we'd worked in the ICU, but it was this event with a patient with um, symptoms that were thought to be Ebola um, that we had in our hospital for about 48 hours that really caused us to learn some of these lessons. What you see here on the screen are some of the news articles uh, from the time. We learned not only about caring for the patient himself, but about the technology around it, the processes about it, and probably most importantly, and Lisa will talk about this, the communications and the event, both internally and externally. All right. so what you see on the slide in front of you are the events nationally related to various cases of patients with actual Ebola or Ebola-like disease including the two highlighted in red uh, that were our direct experience here at Yale New Haven Hospital. As we watch the national scene around patients with Ebola, particularly the experiences at Texas Health, uh, we attempted to be as proactive as we could uh, in leveraging our technology both within the EMR and around it to help our healthcare team be as aware um, and active in screening and caring for these patients as possible. And we very much valued um, the experiences at Texas Health and our ability to learn some important lessons about how to leverage the technology to that end. So our response overall, uh, and not in any order of importance, but uh, more from, I think, our experience and ability to speak to them today. Um, our first response internally uh, in, in our IT organization was to leverage the electronic medical record. And we'll talk a little bit about how we did that uh, and some of our lessons learned for all of you as well. We also took advantage uh, of deploying our telemedicine technology and tools. Uh, and then in particular, as we sat with operational and clinical leaders across our health system, really hearing the strain and stress and difficulty in moving caregivers into and out of these patient rooms. Um, really, it presented a unique opportunity to leverage the technology to both minimize that traffic into and out of the rooms and actually improve the experience of the patient in communicating with their care team. So, you know, the large moon suits uh, are a little bit intimidating to patients uh, and not the most conducive to a face-to-face -face conversation whereas a physician sitting remotely in an office 
um, and communicating on a tablet device to the patient presented a unique opportunity for much more face-to-face -face conversation, as counterintuitive as that seems uh, to do it through a computer screen. Um, the remaining uh, responses really relate to our overall organizational response around the personal protective equipment, um, designating specific isolation rooms for these potential patients, um, incredible focus on training and using simulation training for all of the staff uh, around the personal protective equipment and interaction with the patient, um, and not just patients with Ebola, but training staff now to communicate and screen every patient walking into our organization. Um, and then Daniel mentioned communication, and I think that's probably one of our biggest uh, pieces of advice for all of you, um, is really around communication both within the organization and externally um, as you prepare both the public and your teams to manage these events. So uh, I think uh, an important point here was that nobody panicked. So we treated this patient with respect and focused mostly on their care delivery. Uh, we kept everybody engaged in the health system and we focused on communication about what was happening both internally and with the media. The leadership of our health system and Yale New Haven Hospital did a very nice job of thinking when and how early they could hold a press conference to keep the external public briefed, uh, keep the press up to date even keeping local elected officials well informed about what was going on. And uh, nobody failed to leverage uh, the right tools and the right people when necessary. You'll see in a little uh, while, we'll show you some of the slides and pictures from the actual event. And there was activity at two in the morning, including um, building and construction to make sure that the patient was in the right location, cared for appropriately and isolated in the right way. But altogether, the uh, organization did a really nice job staying calm and focusing on the uh, patient. As is often the case, um, that high-level plan made great sense to all of us and to our uh, colleagues here in the health system. And as we started to peel back the layers of the onion, uh, you start to see that the devil truly is in the details. And we'll just talk through some of our experiences uh, related to that. So first, um, we'll focus on leveraging the EMR. Uh, and again, this preceded um, our experience or even knowing that we might receive a patient. Uh, again, in, in hearing the experiences elsewhere in the country um, and, you know, seeing across many publications, particularly in the health IT arena, uh, really putting scrutiny on the electronic medical record and its role in perhaps not uh, helping to identify uh, that index case. Uh, we really wanted to be sure that we were leveraging and optimizing the use of the tool. Uh, and I give all of the credit to my incredibly dedicated team uh, who really looked at uh, our EMR in particular and how we could leverage its um, abilities. And so we first proposed that we implement a mandatory travel screening at all points of entry into the organization. Um, and that truly included all points of entry from the emergency department through the workflow where patients are directly admitted to an inpatient unit, um, including the labor and delivery uh, patient flow. It included all of our ambulatory sites of care across the faculty practices, private physician offices for whom we provide the electronic medical record and the traditional hospital-based uh, outpatient environments. Um, it also included procedural areas like lab draw stations, uh, radiology imaging centers out in the community, as well as the interventional radiology and cardiology uh, sites. And that's an incredibly complex set of clinical uh, environments. And our EMR actually presents to users in those areas in different ways. And so implementing a standard screening tool uh, to work itself into the electronic workflow in all of those areas um, was no easy task, uh, and the team managed it incredibly well. We coupled the travel screening with then some clinical decision support tools or best practice alerts so that when the patient was identified as having had traveled to one of the indicated countries, um, an alert was then uh, displayed to the individual at that point in time, directing them in what to do, including moving the patient to a private negative pressure room if it was available in that clinical setting. It also included instruction if you were a non-clinical caregiver or, or non-clinical staff member uh, to obtain uh, and bring to the patient uh, a clinical caregiver uh, to help further assess the patient's clinical status. 
And then uh, we also flagged the patient's medical record with banners and flags uh, at various points in the electronic medical record, um, you know, summary reports or views in the patient banner where demographics are displayed so that um, if you were a caregiver or staff member uh, and you were interacting with a patient, uh, there was no doubt that they either had been screened and screened positive uh, or perhaps had not been screened. So Lisa makes a very good point. We have uh, well over 500 different points of entry, and the people who are manning these different points can be anywhere from trained caregivers and clinicians to clinical staff who otherwise have no clinical experience, and standardizing the way that they ask the questions and teaching them what to do was very, very important. Um, forcing them to follow the process was a challenge as well. As much as we could, we tried to make the steps that they followed mandatory. But when you think about your own health system or hospital or large physician practice, and you think about where you actually have clinical staff, think about the lab draw station that has nobody clinical there um, other than perhaps phlebotomists. And when the patient presents, you have to decide what to do with them. We certainly don't have um, protective equipment at every one of these 500 locations. So we had to decide what we were gonna do with the patients in terms of isolating them, sitting in a, in a mental room, and then deciding what to do in terms of transporting them to the right location afterwards. Right, and as more and more of our operational and clinical colleagues engaged in preparatory activities, um, it was our ITS leaders that were often the common presence uh, across all of those groups. Um, and I think were a key driver in maintaining consistency and collaboration. Um, so. As you can imagine, in stressful situations like this, people's initial response is to focus inward and, and manage their four walls or their span of control. Um, and when we participate in those uh, conversations, we are often the one of the unifying forces uh, at the foundation of those conversations. Um, and I think that's a key highlight. You know, not only are our tools present in all of those variety of settings, uh, but we are a, a very important presence as well. So as Daniel said, um, one of the most challenging aspects of this was the fact that non-clinical staff are often the patient's first contact, particularly in the ambulatory areas. And uh, very specifically, we included those travel screening questions in the front desk workflow. So the registrar or business associate sitting at the front desk in any one of our ambulatory sites is the face of the organization that is asking the patient uh, if they've traveled out of the country or had contact with someone who has. Um, you know, I would tell you uh, we had had minor instances where patients uh, didn't appreciate that question, uh, and those, those staff members handled those situations uh, incredibly well. But we did focus some time and attention on addressing their concerns as non-clinicians asking those questions. Um, they were obviously concerned about their own well-being. What if that patient answers yes? What do I do for myself and a room full, perhaps, of uh, other patients and visitors in the waiting room? And so that went through very careful uh, planning, scripting, um, and again, the use of our simulation teams to let folks work through those. And so this was a good example where, you know, I would tell you we had our clinical tools ready to deploy, um, you know, well before we had all the operational details, uh, but they were critical to making sure that we could roll that out successfully. In addition to the EMR themselves, we use signage, as I'm sure many of you do in your own health systems or large physician practices, letting people know that we were going to be asking them these questions, letting them know what to look out for in terms of signs and warning. Uh, the notice on the left is from our health system. Um, the one on the right, interestingly, is from a national, uh, national Health System Trust Hospital in the UK. So even looking around the world, we all tend to follow roughly the same processes and making sure that our patients know what we're going to be asking them. So the second major component of our response from an IT perspective, uh, again, was the deployment of our telemedicine tools. So uh, we were fortunate in that uh, we had recently, but prior to this, uh, established uh, an electronic ICU bunker uh, and had both the audio video equipment and the tools within our electronic medical record at our disposal. Um, and we quickly deployed our technical and applications teams, uh, and you see them uh, in the picture on the right. 
uh, actually meeting and planning the approach uh, to get all of that implemented in really short order. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, while other construction and preparatory activities were going on in the patient care units planned to receive these patients. Uh, this was incredibly positively received, uh, and again, getting the technology in the hands of the patient uh, facilitated both their communication with our care team, uh, as well as their ability to communicate with family and uh, friends who obviously have no access directly to the patient uh, while they're in isolation. Um, and that was, um, a again, a nice way to bridge a pretty stressful situation. And this is where actually having the patient who turned out to be uh, Ebola negative was a good drill experience for our health system, we wouldn't have thought about some of the things that we ran into. So at two in the morning when we were preparing for this patient to be moved from the ED to the ICU, our infectious disease physicians and other clinicians said, you know, it would really be good for us to have 24 by seven communication with the patient in and out of the room. So we leveraged our telecom people and they set up essentially a phone bridge in and out of the room. It was only 10 feet away from each other through a glass door, but that ability to communicate without going in was important. One thing we also didn't think about was the difficulty of getting PPE on and off, and I'm sure you've heard news stories about the challenges of it. Um, our infectious disease coordinators wanted to be able to actually see the people going in and out of the room and how they were donning and doffing their PPE, and so we had another phone set up literally so a third-party observer not involved in the process of putting on and taking off the protective suits could speak in real time with the people who were doing so. So if they saw any problems, if they saw them violate protocol, if they saw any areas of their body weren't covered, they could speak uh, through a two-way uh, phone into the room and let them know that there were problems. And Lisa actually um, underestimated just what the value was of the bedside tablet device. She and her team had rolled out a pilot to um, about 15 beds of one of our oncology units, uh, bedside tablets, including um, the ability to look at Netflix and do Skype with family members, look at the internet as a way to communicate um, both uh, for patient entertainment and so they'd be aware of what their caregiver team was what their drugs were, what their schedule for the day was in an integrated way with our EMR. We've been live with that pilot for about six weeks, was it? Uh, we came live over the summer, actually, right. so it's been a few months. Yep. Okay, so we had those tablets actually up about five floors away from the ICU floor where this patient was going, so we made a decision literally at three in the morning to go grab one of the tablets that was being used in a pilot and put it in the patient's room. And this is where pre-staging, and you don't think about it ahead of time, but nobody was gonna go in from an IT point of view after the patient arrived. So we actually pre-staged that with a um, charger so the patient would find it when he arrived, and that was well received by this patient. Absolutely. So um, as Daniel mentioned, uh, a whole lot of steps briefly summarized here, but uh, this did require a fair amount of coordination across each of our individual hospitals uh, in the health system, and our teams work very well in parallel with the local uh, building facilities and clinical teams to make sure that that implementation was consistent uh, with the overall plan going on at each organization. Um, it also helped us understand, you know, there are varying levels of understanding of the tools, uh, and so we responded with appropriate training and teaching at each of the organization. Um, and then, you know, there are, you know, many ways to uh, skin a cat, and that was pretty clear in this as well. So we have varying degrees of telemedicine, and each situation is, is somewhat uniquely different. So we've spent um, most of our time up to now talking about the telemedicine tools in relation to uh, the actual patient room, uh, and then we started to get requests for a, additional audiovisual support um, in areas, the decontamination chambers and our emergency departments and some of the ambulatory settings uh, that required less equipment but still um, allowed us to enable some good audiovisual uh, communication. And Anthony, this is probably a uh, WebEx for another time, but one of the uh, tools that our team set up um, in addition to leveraging our EMR was literally the audiovisual and the, um, the cameras. And our physicians in the bunker uh, thought highly of, even before we came down with the potential Ebola patient, these tools. And at one point they commented that you could count the number of eyelashes that a patient had so this is not a fuzzy, blurry image of the patient. This is uh, audiovisual tools so good that they can actually do skin examinations remotely. And in that way, we felt like we were protecting our caregivers from having to have so many of them in the room at one time. Right. 
And then, as I said, uh, the remaining points around our response organizationally uh, focus a lot, obviously, on the actual preparation of the clinical teams. Uh, so identifying, procuring, and distributing the personal protective equipment uh, was an incredible area of focus. Uh, we chose to be ahead of, uh, if not, um, or always in accordance with the CDC, but in some cases ahead of the recommendations in terms of the level of personal protective equipment, um, and that's probably a moot point now, but our, our goal was to be consistent across all sites, uh, even when there was some recommendation that you could vary uh, the levels of PPE. Um, as I said, we designated specific rooms rooms for potential patients, uh, utilizing negative pressure facilities uh, where available, uh, and this included the emergency department and inpatient units. Uh, training and simulation, I think, is an area that uh, deserves a lot of emphasis. Uh, I mentioned uh, we implemented the tools in our electronic medical record, and we needed to push information and training out about the tools, uh, and we utilized the EMR itself. Um, to make available some of those tools. Uh, again, we had to prepare staff for what to do when a patient presented with positive risk factors, uh, including you know, communication with others uh, in, the, in the vicinity of that patient. Uh, donning and doffing of the PPE is a major area of focus, and we've now all heard that nationally, that the doffing of the PPE is the biggest risk point. Uh, and again, a lot of use of the uh, simulation and training around that. Um, and then we did implement uh, a buddy system so that as a caregiver is donning and doffing their personal protective equipment, we have another caregiver with them who's directly observing uh, and making sure that they don't uh, create a breach. You see in these two slides some of the work that we did, and literally these were taken um, between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on the morning of October 16th while the patient had presented and was in our ED. Um, we, we have negative pressure rooms, we have isolated rooms in the ICU, but what we realized is we wanted to isolate even the vestibule outside of those rooms. So we had a construction team come in around midnight, one in the morning, and start building a wall with a door to isolate the area where people would be donning and doffing PPE. And we had that in place by uh, 5 a.m. and moved the patient at about 6 a.m. In the picture on the lower right-hand corner, you see um, back in the, uh, in the left, the nurses in blue who are practicing donning and doffing the PPE. And on the right was actually our environmental services team that was practicing putting the equipment um, on and off. What's difficult to see, though, is in the far distance on the far right side are two people with their backs to the camera, and that was our IT team installing the phones that go in and out of the room, and you see about mid-screen one of those phones set up on a permanent bridge so they could communicate with the people in the room there. So it really was a collaborative affair between all parts of the health system. Right, and this screen is just an example. Uh, as I mentioned, communication and education were key. This is actually the login screen to our electronic medical record, and what you see at the bottom uh, beneath that biohazard red symbol are the evolving information that we were pushing out uh, or making available to our uh, clinicians and staff as we were developing the tools and the logic uh, and other information about preparedness. Uh, we often leverage this login screen because it is um, a highly trafficked location uh, where staff are are coming and seeing information as they conduct their work. Um, in addition, we posted the same information or had links to it from our hospital intranet site as well. And again, uh, to be underscored completely, uh, the importance of training, uh, and I think I touched most of these points. Um, the piece, uh, the last bullet, really around leveraging internal experts. So when we sat with our clinical colleagues and really thought about, you know, who are our internal experts around sterile technique, uh, those in our operating room environments, you know, do this every day over and over, and they were key um, support and, and resources with subject matter expertise on that that we tapped into. We have experts in emergency preparedness, and then we run a simulation and training center, uh, and all three work very closely together to work on preparing our staff uh, around the PPE uh, pr processes. So Lisa talked earlier about the, the importance of communications. Uh, we designated an incident commander and, uh, and communicated well during the event. What it caused us to do afterwards was realize that we needed to standardize across all of our delivery networks the same way to uh, respond. So we started uh, daily Ebola operations meeting at each one of our uh, hospital campuses meetings across the health system, and we got very good about communications both internally and externally. 
Right, and particularly around communication, um, the organization, the entire health system really established a clear chain of command around communications. And in the first few days, you know, there were staff members who went out and notified the press or were talking with the press, and we needed to really get that under control. Um, the communication uh, absolutely required, you know, coordination and comfort level among the various groups um, that are not normally used to unifying communication. Um, and so where each, you know, hospital president uh, is very used to their own vertical chain of command around communication, we were asking them to do that at a unified level um, that had not really been our norm. Um, and so that was really important. Uh, we had to take a very firm uh, no tolerance approach around staff who did go out and speak with the press uh, and we communicated very clearly that there would be uh, disciplinary repercussions uh, if that were to happen um, and that instead all communication was to be funneled through the chain of command. Uh, of course, the social media and the press are often impossible to control and uh, we just dealt with that uh, as it presented. To emphasize one of the points Lisa made, uh, many people play roles that they don't normally play. So our IT team was the glue which held many of the different uh, planning and coordination efforts together. And our IT, our IT team was the group of people who saw things happening in each one of our hospitals and delivery networks. As a result, we needed to get really good at communicating back and forth so we could maintain the common communications. Uh, and it worked out quite well in the end. Right. And these are just a few examples, you know, both the formal communication coming through our uh, internal process, uh, as well as we tried to leverage social media ourselves uh, to be sure that we were presenting the right and positive message. Uh, one of the other challenges that we have within the Yale New Haven Health System and the Yale School of Medicine is that we have two different entities. So the Yale School of Medicine is part of Yale University and the Yale New Haven Health System is an independent, not-for-profit health system. So we needed to coordinate both within the Yale New Haven Health System, but then on both sides of the street with the School of Medicine and Yale University. And so there was coordination that happened both vertically and horizontally among both of these institutions. Okay, and I think this is probably a really important point, uh, particularly for this audience. Um, you know, as Daniel mentioned, and I think I've said it a few times as well, keeping our IT teams and leaders engaged uh, was really critical in this process. And as the organization was originally preparing its response um, and coordinating groups uh, to prepare, you know, the use of technology and our tools within the EMR did not come naturally uh, to their, you know, set of things to do. Um, and we were really advocating for use of the tools, both on the telemedicine side uh, and within our electronic medical record. And I think this experience uh, really made it clear to the organization the power of the tools uh, that we have at our disposal. And to that point, uh, this has allowed us to really make points within our health system about what we have in place already. And it's encouraged us to do a better job of communicating what we have on development, what's out there already, and to make available to our clinicians these tools. Um, so whether it's basic telecoms, basic video, or applications that are embedded as part of our larger EMR, getting these out there in people's hands has been very important, and this was an opportunity to do just that. Right. Again, I think it really emphasized the fact, you know, every one of us and almost every staff member in the organization has some touch with technology every day, uh, and our ability to leverage that to do everything from just inform about what the organization was doing to the actual screening of patients uh, at risk was an incredibly powerful uh, example. So um, one of the challenges of healthcare leaders is, and particularly IT leaders, that we need to play um, a role on the technology side and the clinical role. We're very fortunate, as are many IT organizations, in that we have a number of caregivers and clinicians in our group. Uh, Lisa's a pharmacist and a former pharmacy director, and we have other MDs and nurses who are in our IT organization. We tapped them as well as we could to make sure that we were helping make the right decisions as we were trying to roll out IT in this space. Right. You know, again, I think um, as, as IT leaders, we do in that way bridge the gaps that often exist between the clinical need and the ability of technology to help bridge those gaps. Uh, and that's an incredibly powerful um, tool and approach, not just in managing infectious disease threats, but broadly uh, across our healthcare enterprise. So with that, Anthony, we'd be uh, happy to take questions. Very good. Wow. That was uh, an incredible presentation. Um, 
And uh, now we have time for a Q&A. So um, go ahead and send your questions in. We'll take a look at those, and then we will um, pose them. Okay, first question. How did you keep the identity of the patient confidential in the face of the press? This is actually uh, pretty straightforward and an easy one in that the identity of the patient was not uh, confidential. It was well known in the press. However, we, st we um, still treated the patient and their identity with respect. So while the person was known to the press and I think had done interviews after returning from West Africa um, and was a uh, student at Yale uh, and was reported to be a student at Yale, we, when we did our briefings and spoke about the patient, simply referred to the patient as the patient. Right, and within the electronic medical record, uh, we utilized our standard health information management policies uh, and actually assigned that patient an alias so that even staff, you know, throughout the organization just couldn't sort of view his record and uh, search around for information. So that, that was protected via an alias. Uh, just uh, it makes me think of when a celebrity comes into the hospital. Are there extra steps you can take with a, with a person you think um, whose record may be more tempting for staffers to wander into? Um, are there extra protections you put in? You mentioned using an alias. Is this other? Are there any other things? And is this something you recommend? Sure. So the use of the alias is probably the most extreme uh, approach that we take. There are other tools within the electronic medical record that uh, protect it or require the person entering the record to enter a reason, uh, and it, it logs the fact that that individual user went into the record and, and their reported reason. So we have layers of protection on records, to your point, whether they're uh, a VIP, a celebrity, or uh, someone who's otherwise needing to be protected. And uh, in some ways, those are only a speed bump, but at least they're a speed bump that make people acknowledge that they are going into somebody's record. Uh, the tool that we use is called Break the Glass. So literally, it allows you to go in, but you simply have to take an extra action called Breaking the Glass mm -hmm. to acknowledge that you're going in and requires you to actually put your credentials in one more time. So there's no way you could say, I didn't know what I was doing. Right. Well, you know, these, these um sort of near misses are very valuable because, as you said, you get to see how things are playing out. Um, when Hurricane Sandy came, people had to deal with um, extended periods without gasoline when generators couldn't run, people couldn't get to work, people couldn't work from home. Um, one of the things that, that I would imagine could come up or may have come up with you and could certainly come up if the outbreak were to grow um, would be IT, and let's look at your world of IT, would be your staffers um, starting to not be so inclined to come to work. People get scared. We saw that. You mentioned you had construction workers in uh, very close to the patient area. Uh, did you deal with any of that, the human factor of people just getting scared? And maybe sort of if you didn't, could you see how it could come up and, and how you might deal with that? I will say that uh, everybody who was around this patient, who we believe to be a positive Ebola patient until proved otherwise, and we treated them that way certainly uh, for respect and for safety, acted very professionally. So there were people up to the moment that the patient was on the floor doing all the work to prepare the ICU. We were undergoing normal emergency department operations in and around where the patient was isolated. And our staff acted, you know, professionally and uh, with a lot of respect and courage, quite frankly. So uh, there may be a point at which uh, things get more challenging, but we did not ask for volunteers. This was the normal course of business for the people who were working at that time, and there was no opt-in or opt-out. Right, and that's where I think the communication was really critical. So there were almost, if not daily, communications from our chief operating and medical officers about um, about the disease itself, you know, it's uh, it's a uh, contagious potential, its mortality, the how we were preparing as an organization, uh, and I think staff really did appreciate knowing that the organization was ready, that other patients were not at risk in coming to the organization for their care, um, and that was really critical. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point to discuss is the relationship between those that are leading IT and those that are leading the clinical side of the house. Uh, and also, I don't know if you could touch on this a little bit, but 
you know, we heard there was a lot of pushback or a lot of frustration with what was coming out of the CDC. Um, th th things were changing a little bit, and um, so there was some lack of clarity there. We saw some governors uh, decide to sort of write their own rules. Things were evolving so quickly. So just talk a little bit about how IT needs to be interacting with the clinical side, um, and it's a two-way street. You mentioned that you were also in a position to tell them what was possible. So they're telling you sort of what's going on with the disease state. You're telling them that based on that information, here's what we can do with our tools. Um, just talk a little bit more about that dynamic. Sure. So you actually laid it out quite well, Anthony, and it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, and at the end of the day, the most important part is presence. So it was not our clinical team who was making decisions in the absence of technology, and they would run issues past us, nor was it IT out in front of any uh, clinical decision maker. It was all of us together in a command center, in huddles, in daily briefings, uh, relaying information as we heard of opportunities to leverage IT. Uh, we would bring them to the table at that moment. Uh, we would have our teams working independently and then bringing potential solutions to the table and then presenting them to our clinical and operational leaders. So it it was more organic than it was structured in any way. It was, and it, you know, we just had to be very proactive uh, around uh, getting to the conversation. Uh, and even if not initially invited to the conversation, uh, joining it so that we were hearing the challenges of the organization uh, and had an opportunity to bring our team and our resources to the table. But that's not something that's built between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. on an October morning. Uh, that's something that we're trying to do all of the time. So this gets mm -hmm. to our challenges as IT leaders more generally, that we need to be involved in and are involved in just about every strategic and operational and clinical decision or process that's, that's out there. And uh, it's often said that the currency of leadership is time. And by spending the time in the months and years before this one incident, working with our colleagues who are leading, their clinician colleagues, uh, the, with the leaders who are leading the health system and individual hospitals, we were there at the table for every one of the decisions. So when it came to a potential crisis like this, it wasn't strange at all that we were right there helping guide the decision making. Right. Very good. Um, I forget where I read it. It was from some military book, um, and the idea was that plans fall apart because there's always one guy who didn't get the memo or who didn't get the order, and that's why the whole plan falls apart. Yeah, you guys are our, on our health system, um, and I, I've heard um, uh, Mike Tyson quoted, which is everybody has a plan <laughs> to the first punch in the face. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> What, where I'm going with this is that um, as you have lessons learned, you're able to incorpor incorporate them into checklists and things like that. If you have a single place, um, it's easier. You know, you've updated it in one place. That's, a, that's the new version of the truth. Um, if you can update it one place and everybody sees that. But you mentioned the dynamic that even though you are largely on a core EMR, most people are still best of suite at best. And then there's some, you know, facets of the organization. You mentioned the dental clinic still on paper. So as you're updating your knowledge base and what you want people to do, talk about IT's role in making sure that everyone is working off the same order and that there isn't one outlying group that didn't get the order and therefore doesn't follow the latest protocol. I know that's that's probably a deep fear for all IT folks. You want to make sure everyone's on the same page by leveraging the tools. So talk about that, please. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could tell you that 100% of the time we have confidence there's not someone out there who didn't get the memo, um, but I think, you know, some of what we've talked about already in terms of um, really leveraging our history and our relationships with key parts of the organization and our presence across various aspects of the clinical operations um, really allowed us day to day to say, you know, we didn't have a clean plan of 10 things on day one that we simply executed. Um, we were evolving the plan as we learned about, you know, the dental clinic is a great example. That one came up probably 
you know, a week into our, our planning around the use of the EMR. Um, and so it really does just take a lot of networking, conversation, discussion um, across the organizations to ensure there's not some, you know, hole in the Swiss cheese that we didn't plug. <laughs> well said. Daniel, any thoughts there? No, nothing to add there. Lisa's spot on. Well, you know, and you mentioned it, um, I hope maybe for our next webinar we do together, um, the audio visual and the cameras. Um, this t internal telemedicine, as it were, remote monitoring from, you know, we're not talking about uh, taking care of someone in a rural area, but we're talking about taking somebody in a room that might as, it's so isolated, it might as well be in a rural area, and maybe the tools are pretty much the same. But um, if you want to go into that a little more, it definitely sounded like you felt like that was something um, effective. Absolutely. You know, I think we are just starting to scratch the surface of our ability to use the audio, video, and uh, in tandem with the electronic medical record and the bedside clinical devices to remotely monitor patients. And that can be leveraged across so our, our traditional approach around the intensive care units. So to leverage the expertise of our intensivists um, and rather than having those intensivists spread across a wide geography of locations in our health system, we can centralize them in one bunker or room where they have the ability to monitor, you know, 100 patients uh, across our intensive care units. Um, that's one approach. Uh, the ability to use those same tools to interact, have a specialist physician interact with the primary care provider and other members of the healthcare team in a unified way with a patient uh, who's in one office um, also gives us incredible potential. So I do think um, that's a great topic for additional conversation at a future time, but um, those tools, I think, are going to become really a key part of our tool belt as health IT leaders uh, going forward. All right. I think I have uh, just one more question. Uh, we're about out of time. Um, Everybody is able to stay focused and locked in and uh, when things are at a crisis, right? So mid-October when all this is happening, everyone's laser locked in. Things are moving. Uh, and my, my question is about as things dissipate and calm down, what are your thoughts around staying vigilant? Um, is, is it important? Is there anything that needs to be done in order to not maybe sort of lose the advantage or lose the lessons learned? That's a really good question, and it goes to our responsibility as IT leaders to make sure that we're ready for anything. Uh, we, are learn we are a learning organization, um, so we don't uh, simply respond to a crisis and then move on. We've tried to codify as many of our lessons learned into our processes as possible from our clinicians to our EMR, to our service desk responses, uh, to our best practices. And in that way, we feel like we've prepared ourselves um, to respond quickly when we face a similar situation like this in the future, even if it requires some learning beyond that. But we have um, issues that have popped up in the four or so weeks since we had this one issue. Um, and we've moved on to the other ones, but we haven't felt like we've lost all of the preparations that we've made in that brief period. That's great. And it sounds like um, when these things happen, um, some folks in the organization that maybe uh, hadn't quite understood the value of IT, it it's, it's one of those things that wakes them up. And they get to say, wow, you know, we get to use it for that too. So I think that's an excellent um, side effect. Um, well, that's about all the time we had t uh, today. I want to thank our speakers, Daniel and Lisa, for joining us, and hopefully they'll join us again uh, in the future on another topic. You'll receive an email when our archive recording is ready, um, usually within two, two business days, uh, usually sooner. For those of you who have the CHIME CHCIO certification, uh, attending our webinars gets you one CEU. Uh, if you've asked us to communicate that to CHIME, we will. If not, please go ahead and remember to get in touch with them yourself. Questions, comments, please email me. And uh, you can go to our website to view our upcoming schedule and see the last 12 months of archived events. So with that, I again want to thank Daniel, Lisa, and our audience, and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.